Today on Blue 58, we have crossed the June 1st threshold. Does that mean an Aaron Rodgers trade is imminent? No, probably not. The real date you need to watch is a few days away, or maybe longer, or maybe never. Let's talk about it. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Happy to be with you here for another episode. It is June 1st. Well, it's June 2nd, at least, when you're listening to this. As I'm recording, it is 8.57 p.m. on June 1st, and Aaron Rodgers has not been traded. We have been hearing since late April that we need to make it to June 1st before anything's really going to happen with Aaron Rodgers and the Packers, and that is true. But June 1st really is not the day we need to be watching, and we'll explain why. First and foremost, what's the big deal about trading after June 1st versus before? Basically, it comes down to how your signing bonus is prorated over your contract. Say that you have a 10-year, $100 million contract. Half of it is salary and half of it is signing bonus. You're getting $50 million up front. You get that $50 million check, but it's broken down over the life of your contract prorated for the duration. So that $50 million signing bonus is spread out over 10 years, $5 million per year in cap charge. The other $50 million in cap in salary is spread over those 10 years as well. So you're getting $5 million per year just in salary, and you've gotten the $50 million up front, but your cap, cap number is $10 million per year. If a team wants to trade you before the end of your contract, any money that is still prorated over the duration of the rest of your contract gets moved up into the current year, and it counts against that cap, against your cap that year. That's the big problem with trading Aaron Rodgers before June 1st, because if they had gone ahead and done that, you would have counted something like $38 million against the cap because of all the cap money that gets pushed forward, all the salary, or all the uh, the signing bonus that had been prorate, prorated over the duration of his contract all gets pushed forward. But after June 1st, Teams are allowed to break that up over a couple of years. So half of that cap charge counts against this year's cap. Half of it counts against next year. So now that we're past June 1st, the Packers can break up the cap charges that they would incur by trading Aaron Rodgers, okay? But that doesn't really matter. Not yet, at least. Because it really isn't hurting either the Packers or Aaron Rodgers for Rodgers to not be around right now. So when does it start to matter? Two dates to keep in mind. First, June 8th. Really, June 8th through the 10th, that's when the Packers' mandatory minicamp is going on in Green Bay. If Aaron Rodgers is not at the mandatory minicamp, he will be fined and could be upwards of around $100,000 if he's not, which gets pretty expensive. If you're talking about normal people money, if you're talking about star NFL quarterback money who wants uh, and that star quarterback wants to be traded to a different team, it's probably not all that much. In the grand scheme, Aaron Rodgers missing out on his $500,000 workout bonus and another $100,000 in fines for missing mandatory minicamps is probably not a huge deal to him if he gets what he wants, if what he wants is to get out of Green Bay. That's a pretty, pretty expensive ticket for most of us. It's a pretty cheap ticket if he gets what he thinks he wants. So that is date number one. Date number two to watch is still undetermined, but it's going to be late July because that's when NFL training camp begins. And that's a bigger deal because if the Packers and Rodgers have not resolved their differences by the start of training camp, then things are really going to get wild. And you really only have to look at what happened with Brett Favre and the Packers to see how wild it can get. One of the most surreal moments of my life as a Packers fan, really sports fan as general, was watching what went down as Brett Favre tried to force his way either back onto the Packers roster or out of Green Bay. You remember what that was like watching Brett Favre's plane arrive in Green Bay during the family night scrimmage in 2008 or 2000? Yeah, it was 2008. Just waiting to see what was going to happen. He shows up at Lambeau Field sitting up in the booth as Aaron Rodgers is down on the field trying to figure out what life is going to be like in his first year as the Packers starting quarterback. Wild. And now we're about ready to see it all play out again if things do not get resolved by the start of training camp. 
at this point, I don't think I expect Rodgers to be around on June 8. But I do expect everything to be resolved and for him to be around at the start of training camp. If things do get resolved, it'll happen between those two times. I think it's kind of a, all right, you've proved your point sort of thing. Now let's get down to brass tacks. Let's really get something done. Because I think it behooves both the Packers and Rodgers if he's going to be around in Green Bay, and I think that is still the most likely scenario. It makes sense for both of them to get a deal done between those two times. There is a long dead period there for the NFL. Six weeks is a long time for the NFL to not be in the spotlight. But that's really what happens through June and July most years. And if the Packers and Rodgers can get something done in that time, they're going to be able to go weeks and weeks and weeks without having to really talk about it in any substantive sense. Brian Gutekunst isn't going to have to go up and give a press conference the day after they sign a big extension. Aaron Rodgers isn't going to have to stand there in the locker room and answer questions. It's just, it'll be nice for them to get it resolved that way because then they can show up on the first day of camp and be like, yep, you know, we, we had our differences. We've sorted them out and uh, we're really excited for Aaron Rodgers to be a, 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 with the Green Bay Packers for a long time to come. So I think between the end of that mini camp and the start of training camp is when it's all going to come to a head. If the Packers do trade them, that would also be a good time to do it too. But if things get into training camp and things are not resolved, that is when things are going to get really messy. I still believe that Rodgers is going to be with the Packers this season, but if he's not back in the fold by the start of training camp, all bets are off at that point. Also related to June 1st is something I want to talk about just briefly because uh, I don't really have to talk about this in depth. Uh, my new Acme Packing Company colleague, Justice Mosqueda, wrote a great piece about the financial realities of training, trading for Julio Jones. The biggest fish in, I guess, NFL quasi-free agency right now, other than Aaron Rodgers, is Julio Jones. And Jones seems eminently more attainable than Rodgers. You're not going to have to give up multiple first-round picks, young players, so on and so forth, to get him. But can the Packers even get him? I think yes. And I don't have to make the case as to whether or not they can because it's already been made quite skillfully uh, by Mr. Mosqueda, who knows a lot more about the salary cap than I do. Just as a side point here, I think the cap is something that we as football fans need to know a little bit more than we do about, but also... There is no point in going super deep on it either because there are people who know it super well already. Great resources like OverTheCap.com, SpotTrack.com, and people who find it really enjoyable to break it break it down already do a great job at, at it. So maybe just follow those resources instead than beating yourself over the head with the, uh, the accounting tables uh, on those websites. Just a thought. But anyway... Justice writes that it's not a super, super big ask to get Julio to Green Bay because of what the Packers can do to move around his signing bonus and salary figures. In fact, if they did what he is suggesting, his cap hits for the next three years would be just $5.8 million, $16.26 million, and $16.26 million again for 2021, 22, and 23. Not too bad. Very doable if he continues to play at an elite level. So that brings us to the other point. What would it actually take for the Packers to get him? I think this is probably a single draft pick sort of situation. Uh, you're probably not going to have to give up multiple high picks to get him. So you're looking at a first round pick or a second round pick or a third round pick. But is that too much? Well, how would you know? I think the best thing to do when you're starting to look at these trades about whether or not it's a good idea to give up X number pick for a guy is to, to look backwards. Sure, it's hard to say, yes, I would give up a second round pick for Julio Jones. But looking back, 
over the past few years, which of these guys would you not give up for Julio Jones? Let's start three years ago, because these are the guys we really know something about for sure. We're cutting off Elton Jenkins and A.J. Dillon here, but let's assume the asking price for Julio Jones ends up being a second-round pick. Sure, I know they like they would like to get a first-round pick, but that's great. It's nice to want things. Let's assume they're really going to settle and get a second-round pick. I know it could be a third-round pick or a fourth-round pick or whatever, considering that you know near-prime Randy Moss, late-prime Randy Moss went for like a four. I think even a three for Jones would be a big win at this point. Let's say they get a two, though. Let's let's say they get a two for him. Well, in 2018, the Packers got Josh Jackson in the second round. Okay, I would trade Josh Jackson for Julio Jones. In 2017, it was Kevin King and Josh Jones. I would trade both of those guys for Julio Jones. In Jason Spr- in 2016, it was Jason Spriggs. I would definitely trade him for Julio Jones. 2015, Quentin Rollins. 2014, Devontae Adams. Okay, we're up to our first guy dating back more than half a decade, that I would not trade straight up for Julio Jones. And you can go further down the list if you want. 13 is Lacey, Eddie Lacey. 2012 is Darrell Worthy. 2011, Randall Cobb. Hmm. You're looking at early years Randall Cobb there for late career Julio Jones. Okay, we'll call that one a push. 2010, Mike Neal. 2009, no second rounder, so nothing there. 2008, Jordy Nelson or Brian Brahm. I'd trade one of those two for sure, as well as Pat Lee, another second round pick. Okay, two of those three would go for sure. You see what I'm saying here? Second round picks are no guarantee. And I think even if it's only a one or two year deal for Julio Jones, getting a known commodity is a great deal with a draft pick. Draft picks are great to have. It's great to have a lot of them. But you know what's really good with your draft picks? You know what the best thing is? To get an absolute known commodity. To to know what you're getting. You could push back, I think, and say, well, we don't know what we're getting for sure with Julio Jones. That is true. Absolutely true. But we do know that if he's healthy, we're getting a pretty darn good wide receiver. So I think I'd be a little bit more inclined to give up a second-round pick than I would have been in the past because you're getting a known commodity. Do I think the Packers will do it? No, I do not. Because it would still take significant work on the salary cap to get it done beyond restructuring Julio Jones' contract. But I think it can be done. It's certainly not impossible. And if you were trying to entice a certain quarterback back into the fold, getting a deal done in principle for Julio Jones would probably be a pretty great way to do it. Like it? Don't like it? Tell me what you think. I'd love to hear about it in Discord, which is a service that we offer, our Discord server, to Patreon supporters. Uh, Visit patreon.com slash thepowersweep and join us there. Support us at any dollar figure and you'll be invited to our Discord server where you can chat with Packers fans from around the world. And you can get a little bit more involved in our upcoming Blue 58 book book club chat as well. We'll be talking about it on the podcast, but you can go a little bit deeper there as well. Today, I'd like to shout out Patreon supporters Michael Winkler, Gary Crook, and Jeffrey T. Ketchum. Oh, excuse me. We did those guys last week. Bonus shout out for those three. How about Sean Namadi, JP, and Anthony Catazone? All three of them supporters since 2019, and I'm thankful to each and every one of you who has chosen to support us there. So if you'd like to get involved with what the Power Sweep's doing on Patreon or Discord or wherever, head to patreon.com slash thepowersweep. Join us there, and uh, we'd be happy to see you there. Got a couple of listener questions I want to finish out with today. First, Noah P. writes in, I think there's a lot to be said for the on-field advantage of having a better offensive line as opposed to having a top running back. And given the Rodgers situation now, does it make more sense what the Packers did to resign Aaron Jones over Corey Lindsley, given the off-field advantage for having a top running back and foregoing re-signing a premium center? I'm thinking about how running backs affect opposing defenses, game plans, taking some of the limelight off Love if he's the starter, etc. Basically, did Goody make the decision knowing a storm was coming with Aaron Rodgers? Great question, and I think there's a lot to pull on here. First and foremost, I don't think uh, Gutekunst made this decision knowing that something was coming with Aaron Rodgers. I don't think that's a good way to run your franchise. 
seems overly reactive to me. But I think your overall thought here is is a good one. Did the Packers bring back Aaron Jones if they knew something was coming with Aaron Rodgers because of how he would support Jordan Love? I like the thought process there, but I think having a fully functional, highly talented offensive line is probably a better support structure for Love than going in with a completely or mostly green center. So look at the Packers' options, even if uh, they knew what was coming with Rodgers and, and made their Aaron Jones decision accordingly to support Jordan Love. Their options at center then, if they don't bring back Corey Lindsley, are Elton Jenkins, who's never been a full-time center, Lucas Patrick, same, Jake Hansen, who spent most of last year either on the practice squad or the practice squad version of injured reserve, or Josh Myers, who has been a full-time center, as has Hansen, but he's a rookie. So I I think if you're looking to support uh, Jordan Love, keeping that center and keeping that offensive line as intact as you can probably does a little bit more for you. Because much of what Aaron Jones does, I think, can be replicated through scheme. You're not going to get as high of a level out of your backfield without Aaron Jones, but I think you can get to a reasonable replacement of it. However, I think there's more to it than just how are the Packers supporting Jordan Love or Aaron Rodgers. I think if you're looking at just the player versus player argument, you probably find your answer as to why the Packers did what they did here. You can argue about how valuable running backs are, But I think if you're looking at just Aaron Jones versus Corey Lindsley, it comes down to this. Aaron Jones is still an elite running back for whatever that's worth in the 2021 NFL. But are we sure that Corey Lindsley is going to continue to be an elite center? He missed three games last year with a variety of injuries. He left two games early in 2019 and probably would have missed the wildcard playoff game that year had the Packers not had a bye. He has also appeared as questionable on the injury report three times since 2017 and has had ongoing back issues since pretty much the same time period. His health is deteriorating. He's aging. He was very, very good last year and has been for a long time. But how sure are you in 2021, 22, 23 that Corey Lindsley is going to be that player? I think there is reason to be concerned. Whatever Aaron Jones is, whatever having a good running back means in the NFL in 2021, I think it's fairly safe to assume that Aaron Jones is going to to continue to be that. He's going to be that version of Aaron Jones for a couple of years at least. He's been pretty mildly used over his first three or four years in the NFL. I don't know if you can say the same for Corey Lindsley. Honestly, in the alternate version where I'm the general manager of the Packers, I would have been tempted to move on from both and pursue lower cost options elsewhere. I can see why they brought Aaron Jones back, but I think if you're just looking to maximize your cap return, you probably just go we'll try to find somebody new. Just try to find a guy who's 75% as good as both of them or 80% as good, and then get a couple more complimentary pieces with the cap space that you save. But I see why they brought back Aaron Jones, and I think he's going to be a terrific player in 2021 and beyond, no matter who is at quarterback. In our Discord server, FMP30 writes in, can we assume that Oren Burks can be at least decent or serviceable in Joe Barry's defense as a coverage linebacker? Good question, and I think Joe Barry opened himself up to this a little bit with some of his comments about uh, what he is expecting from inside linebackers and the Packers inside linebacker group, as well as switching Oren Burks back from outside linebacker, where he lined up a little bit last year, under Mike Patton, to his more traditional inside linebacker spot. To Mr. FMP's question, no, I don't think we can assume anything with Oren Burks. 
And that is for the simple reason that Oren Burks has not given us much good evidence to assume anything positive about his game at this point. What is his game? Well, I don't think it's coverage. Pro Football Focus has grade hit him out pretty poorly in coverage over his three years so far in the NFL. In 2018, he graded a 46.4 out of 100. Not great. 2019, slightly worse, 36.1. 2020, even worse, 30.1. Sports Information Solutions says he's given up eight completions on 12 targets since 2018, a robust 9.8 yards per target in that span. Pro Football Reference, even worse, 13 completions on 18 targets since 2018. So coverage is probably not going to be it for Oren Burks. However, I think there is reason to be slightly optimistic here, and I am probably slightly more optimistic on Oren Burks than I am on Josh Jackson, though I think there is some similarities here. Uh, People have talked about how Jackson's game is well-suited to Joe Barry's scheme. That could be the case. I think Oren Burks, with his athleticism, may be well-suited to some things that Joe Barry wants to do. We've talked about this in the past, but Barry's fronts are going to be a little bit more one-gap and penetration-oriented than Mike Pettin's more traditional 3-4 scheme. So Barry is also going to play a 3-4 base, but his fronts, he wants to to get into the gaps and get upfield from there while doing some very complex things on the back end with his safeties and corners. If Joe Barry wants his linebackers to penetrate and get upfield more, I, that might be a good thing for Oren Burks. If there's anything that he should be able to do well, it's read one gap and get upfield in a hurry. If nothing else on the football field, Oren Burks is a tremendous athlete. He tested very well at just about everything, and you'd expect that because he's a former defensive back. He was a safety for a long time at Vanderbilt. And really, in his life as a linebacker, he's, he's pretty young. He didn't play linebacker super in depth until late in his Vanderbilt career. And now he's really in like year four and a half at linebacker heading into his fourth professional season. So he's pretty new at this. Doing things that just require you to be a great athlete and move fast and hit things might just be right up his alley. Coverage might not be it. But I think there is still reason to be optimistic about Oren Burks playing playing in Joe Barry's scheme. So I've got for you on this episode. Appreciate you listening in. If you enjoyed this episode and uh, learned something or just want to continue this conversation or get other people involved, I'd appreciate it if you would share it with somebody you think would enjoy it. Uh, that's going to, like I said, get more people involved in the conversation we're having about the Packers and ultimately help everybody, me included, become smarter Packers fans. Because as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans. And better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.